Good morning and welcome and thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you've tuned in. Last week we started a verse-by-verse series through the book of Hebrews. And I've been in ministry over 36 years, but I've never preached all the way through the book of Hebrews. There's just so many powerful passages in Hebrews that I have preached from, but I've never taken a verse-by-verse walk through it. So I'm excited about our adventure together. The title for our series is Fix Your Eyes on Jesus, because we're going to be learning some powerful truths about the person, power, and prominence of Jesus Christ. To me, the whole climax of the book is in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, where we learn the names of those in God's Hall of Fame of Faith. And then as we move into the 12th chapter, the writer challenges us. And he writes that since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we should run with patience the race that is set before us. And that's what we're doing every day. We are running the race that is the Christian life. This race, it's not a sprint. It's an ultra marathon. And we aren't competing against each other. Uh, When I think about this race, I always smile when I remember the joke of the two guys out in the woods who are hunting squirrels, and they came upon a great big old hungry bear. (coughs) And they emptied their rifles into the bear, which only just made him madder. So they turned to run from it, and as they started chasing them, you know, and they were running for their lives, and one of the old boys started kicking off his heavy hunting boots so that he could run faster. And his friend running beside him said, Man, it's no use kicking off your boots. You can't outrun that bear. And his friend kicked off the second boot and said, I don't have to outrun that bear. I just have to outrun you. You know, the Christian race is not a competition. In fact, we should be encouraging one another as we run this race. And the key to staying in the race is our focus verse for the series in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So today, we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus and discover why he is superior to the angels. And we're going to be reading in Hebrews chapter 1 today. But before we read, let's sing that little chorus that I mentioned last week uh, um, during our service. It said, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4 it says, Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And... You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. 
and they will all grow up like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now, if that passage seems a little convoluted to you, let me break it down into bite-sized pieces. The writer is quoting seven different passages out of the Old Testament, and he applies each of those to Jesus. Now, you may know that the Old Testament was originally written in the language of the ancient Hebrews, but about 150 years before Jesus showed up in Bethlehem, the Greek rulers wanted to be able to read the Old Testament in their own language, and so 70 different scholars were commissioned to translate the entire Old Testament into Greek, and because of their having 70 translators, it is called the Septuagint, and it is designated by the Roman numeral for 70, which is LXX. Now, this was a particularly important document because Greek was the language spoken by most of the people during the first century. And all of these seven quotations from the Old Testament that I just read are from the Septuagint, not the Hebrew Old Testament. Like a good attorney, the writer is going to lay out a solid case for why Jesus is greater than the angels. And he actually presents five different arguments. Now, you may be thinking, well, what's the big deal? Of course, Jesus is greater than the angels. Why even argue the point? Well, it's because when this letter was written, there were Hebrew readers who were slipping away from their faith. And they were thinking about sliding back into Judaism. And angels play a prominent part in Judaism. And by presenting these five arguments, you and I can come to a deeper appreciation and higher adoration of who Jesus really is. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And let's look at these five arguments presented by the writer of the Hebrews. Here's the first argument. Jesus has a greater name than the angels. You know, we read in verse 4 that Jesus has become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, there are many names used in the Bible for God. Uh, Two little fellows were talking about God, and one of them said, do you know what God's name is? And the other one said, sure, his name is Andy. And the first one said, Andy, how do you know that? And the other kid said, well, we sang about him at church yesterday. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. Well, God's name isn't Andy. Uh, The best name for God is Jesus, and his name is superior to the names of the angels. Now, it's Bible trivia time. How many angels are given names in the Bible? Well, the correct answer is two. The only archangel, which means a leader angel, is Michael. Now, the name Michael means who is like God, and the second angel named in the Bible is Gabriel, and his name means God is great. Now, some folks, they want to say that there's a third angel in Scripture, and his name is supposedly Lucifer, but Lucifer is really only mentioned in in Isaiah chapter 14. Uh, And if you read Isaiah 14, the prophet Isaiah begins first by talking about Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And Isaiah describes this puffed up king who thought he was hot stuff until God humbled him. And at the end of that chapter, Isaiah reminds us again that he's only talking about the king of Babylon, 
a man. He is not talking about an angel. Now, a lot of folks want to read into that passage that Lucifer was some sort of a fallen angel, but the word angel never actually appears in the Hebrew text. But Isaiah 14 is actually describing the events that Daniel writes about in Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar gets so full of himself and so filled with self-importance that God decided to knock him down a peg or two or ten. Uh, We are told that God humbled the king of Babylon and caused him to live like an animal. I mean, he grew long mangy hair and long toenails and fingernails and there was slobber down his cheeks and wild eyes and he was eating grass like an animal. And for seven long years, Nebuchadnezzar lived like that. And at the end of the seven years, God restored his mind and old Nebi was no longer clucking his own praise, but he was worshiping and praising the God of heaven. And the very last words we have recorded of Nebuchadnezzar and the last mention of him in the whole book of Daniel is Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, where Nebu- he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways are justice. And those who walk in pride he is able to put down. As far as we know, Nebuchadnezzar died as a follower and believer in Almighty God. So, only two angels named in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. The name of Jesus is greater than the name of any angel. It means God saves. Don't you just love the name of Jesus? There is no name under heaven given among men that can save us. There is no situation that is greater than the name of Jesus. His name is above all names. You know, COVID-19 is just a name. Cancer is just a name. Discouragement, depression, poverty, loneliness, and anxiety are all just names of things that keep us captive. Whatever the circumstances are, whatever the trials or tribulation or trouble we may find ourselves in, they are all just names, which are under one greater name, the name of Jesus. You know, the name of Jesus is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, and they are saved. So when you are down and out, and you are in need of direction, Call on the name of Jesus, and he will set you free. A second argument as to why Jesus is greater than the angels is, Jesus is God's son. Angels are God's servants. Verse 5 of the text, uh, the Hebrew writer asks a question. For to who, uh, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son today, I have begotten you. Well, the answer is zero. Nada. Zip. God never said anything like that to any angel. The book of Hebrews was being written to Jewish believers who had probably heard some false teachers claiming that Jesus was just another powerful angel and that he certainly wasn't God. You know, there are many voices today telling us that Jesus was less than God. Our Muslim friends claim Jesus was a great prophet like Moses or Abraham. You know, I I remember as a kid listening to the radio when I first heard George Harrison singing that song, My Sweet Lord. And I thought, cool, he's a Christian, and he's singing about Jesus. And boy, yeah, I'd sing right along. I really want to see you. I really want to know you. 
But as the song went on and I got a little bit older and could actually understand what he was singing about, uh, George Harrison identified his Lord as the Hindu deities, Krishna and Vishnu, Brahma and others. Now, Hindus would tell you that that song is about Jesus because Jesus was just another incarnation of Krishna, but they would never acknowledge him as the one true living God. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear that Jesus wasn't just an angel or a, a other lower being. God never said to any angel, you are my son. But when Jesus came up out of the river after being baptized, God spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Now the angels are occasionally called the sons of God when they are described collectively. But no individual angel is ever called the Son of God. That title is reserved for Jesus alone. You know, angels are a hot topic today. I mean, if you Google the word angel, you'll find over one billion links. Some people claim that they have been touched by an angel, while most of them are just a little touched in the head. The two main roles of angels are to serve and deliver messages. They serve God, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, and they also serve those who will inherit salvation. So don't go looking for angels. Put your eyes on Jesus, the Son of God. The third argument that tells us that Jesus is greater than the angels, Jesus is worshipped and angels worship him. Verse 6 of our text says, But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Now the word firstborn in this text here doesn't refer to birth order, but it refers to rank. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says that Jesus was the firstborn over all creation. To say that Jesus was God's firstborn might imply that God had other sons, but firstborn was a legal standing that signified one who would receive the main inheritance of the Father. Now, can you think of an example in the Old Testament where the son who was actually born first wasn't the firstborn and received an inheritance? Well, you're probably thinking about Jacob, who was born second to Esau, but he really tricked his father out of the inheritance. A better example would be Solomon. He was actually 10th in the birth order, but he received the throne from his father David. Now, angels should never be worshipped but we know that there's a dangerous practice in the early church containing the worship of angels. We read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. Over in the book of Revelation, the apostle John is escorted by an angel through a vision of church history from Calvary up to the triumphant second coming of Christ. And on two occasions, John was so overwhelmed that he fell down to worship the angel. And on both occasions, the angel had a holy fit and said, don't worship me, I'm just an angel. Worship God. When Jesus began his ministry, Satan tempted him. Satan showed Jesus all the riches of the world and said, all this will be yours if you'll bow down and worship me. 
Jesus pulled out the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God, and he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. He says, It is written, Fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Now, was Jesus ever worshipped during his time on earth? You know, we read about the Magi, the wise men who came and brought him gifts, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Jesus didn't get up out of the manger and say, don't worship me, worship God. You know, when Jesus walked on the water and he got into the boat with the disciples, the Bible says that the disciples worshipped him. Jesus didn't stop them and say, don't worship me, worship God. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, people were waving palm branches and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those Pharisees, they had a holy fit that Jesus was being worshipped. So they said, Rabbi, rebuke these people who are worshipping you. I think Jesus might have smiled a little bit when he said, well, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out in praise. I think he was referring to the prediction of Isaiah 55, 12 that says that the mountains and hills will break forth into singing and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Now, if only God is worthy to be worshipped, and Jesus accepted worship, what would that make him? God. We should be worshiping Jesus because he is God. So put your eyes on Jesus and worship him. A fourth argument as to why Jesus is greater than the angels, Jesus will rule forever. Angels are his subjects. You know, verse 8 of our text says, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now, if you understand that God is doing the speaking here, notice that he, God, the Father, calls Jesus the Son, God. In other words, God calls Jesus God. Now, how in the world can that be? Well, that's the mystery of the triunity of God. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there's only one God. The Father is God. Jesus the Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. Now, that concept is beyond our ability to completely comprehend. But I always quote how John Wesley described the Trinity. He said, if you can explain to me how there can be three candles in a room, but only one light, then I'll explain to you the Trinity. You know, some people try to claim that the Bible never calls Jesus God, but they're wrong. He is referred to God many times throughout scriptures. Jesus told the man who delivered, uh, the man delivered from the demons to go home and tell the great things that God had done for him. And so he went about telling the people what Jesus had done. No difference. Thomas poked his hands into the scars in the side of Jesus and he said, my Lord, and my God. Titus wrote about looking for the blessed hope, which is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As God, Jesus will rule the universe forever. You know, there are some people in the United States who prefer that our politicians be restricted by term limits. You know, that's an interesting debate. Uh, but for sure, there is no term limits for Jesus. He was never elected, and he cannot be voted out of office. Jesus will rule and reign forever and ever and ever, and then you can add forever and ever beyond that. 
In the year 1741, George Frederick Handel was a composer who was deeply in debt and sinking into depression. And he took it upon himself to put selected passages of scripture to music. And he called his composition the Messiah. And he wrote the entire oratorio in just 24 days. And he hardly slept or ate. There is a story that as he was completing the famed Hallelujah Chorus, his servant knocked on his door but received no reply. And he reported that as he opened the door and entered the room, that Handel had his head down on his, his composition. And when Handel raised his head and looked up, there were tears in his eyes. And he lifted the pages of the Hallelujah Chorus and says, I have seen the face of God. There's a story that when King George II heard the Hallelujah Chorus, he was so overcome with the majesty and glory of God that the king stood to his feet. And even to this day, when the Hallelujah Chorus is sung, people stand, not just to emulate the act of an earthly king, but to show honor for our heavenly king, the heavenly king of kings and lord of lords, as they hear those words straight out of Revelation 19, and he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus rules. Keep your eyes on him. The fifth argument on why Jesus is better than the angel, Jesus is the creator. Angels were created. In verse 10, we read these words spoken to Jesus. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hand. Jesus was present at creation. Angels were also present because Job tells us they shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid. But Jesus was never created. He is the creator. Now, do you understand what that means? The next time you read the Declaration of Independence, you ought to read it this way. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are bestowed by Jesus certain unalienable rights. But our Hebrew text goes on to say in verses 11 and 12 uh, that one day this earth and hev these heavens will grow old and wear out like a tattered garment. Have you ever had a piece of clothing that you liked so much that you just wore it for years? Maybe you wore it so much that it finally wore out. Um, heard about a fellow who had a favorite sweatshirt that he wore all the time, and he had never done the laundry, and one weekend his wife was away visiting her parents, and so he called her up and he said, I want to wash my sweatshirt, but what setting do I use on the washing machine? And she said, well, look on the shirt. What does it say? And he looked at it, and he said, well, it says Ohio State. So what will Jesus do when this heaven and earth wears out? Well, this passage says that he'll just fold up the old heaven and the old earth like you would roll up an old bathrobe that's too tattered to donate to the Salvation Army or Goodwill. And he'll toss it aside and do what he does best. He'll create. We read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, 
God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You know, heaven is for real, but not because of the book or because of the boy who supposedly had that dream. Heaven is for real because of what the Bible says. We'll see Jesus, we'll see our loved ones who were saved, and we'll be forever with him. I love the quote by C.S. Lewis. He said, there is no need to be worried by facetious people who tried to make the Christian hope of heaven ridiculous by saying they, they do not want to spend eternity playing harps. The answer to such people is that if they cannot understand books written for grown-ups, they should not talk about them. <laughs> Jesus is greater than the angels. Now, have you figured that out yet? It's all about Jesus. You know, when I was in about the fifth or sixth grade, we had to take music class. And the teacher decided that we needed to learn about musicals. And one of the musicals that she told us about and tried to teach us some songs to was West Side Story. Now, West Side Story is not my favorite musical. You might know that West Side Story is loosely based on Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and I remember hardly nothing about that musical except for one song called Maria. Now, I'm sorry, it's just one of those songs that once you get it in your mind, you're going to be humming it all day, and maybe all night too. Anyway, in the musical, you have Tony, who meets and kisses Maria, and he breaks into song. And I had to look up all the lyrics because I could only remember the first line. But here's here's what the song says. Maria, I just met a girl named Maria, and suddenly that name will never be the same to me. Maria, I just kissed a girl named Maria, and suddenly I found how wonderful a sound can be. Maria, say it loud and there's music playing. Say it soft and it's almost like praying. Maria, I'll never stop saying Maria, the most beautiful sound I've ever heard, Maria. Well, let me tell you something. I feel the same way about the name of Jesus. Once I met Jesus, everything changed. Suddenly, that name will never be the same again. Jesus, say it loud and there's music praising. Say it soft, and it really is praying. Jesus, I'll never stop saying Jesus, the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. Jesus. Jesus is greater than any other person who has ever walked this planet. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Keep your eyes on Jesus because he is greater than the angels. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. What a precious name. Jesus is. It's a name that we can go to whenever we are discouraged, whenever we are down. Lord, whenever we need help, we can call upon the name of Jesus. 
Father, I pray today that for those who will be listening, Lord, help them to remember to call upon the name of Jesus. Father, I pray today we would seek our hope and our help from Jesus. Lord, help us. We ask, Father, that you would just speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that we would see that the name of Jesus is a strong tower. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll be continuing our brand new sermon series on Hebrews. And don't forget to join us Wednesday mornings for our live online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. You can join us live on Facebook Wednesdays at 10.30 a.m. If you miss any of the Bible studies or sermons, you can check them out on Facebook you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube, and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using that Google account, and you can actually subscribe to our channel, help you to find it a little quicker. So check that out. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.